welcome in all of our friends and loved ones that watch us from around the world. We love you. We thank God for you. And welcome to week five and the last installment of this relationship series that we've titled, It's Not Me, It's You, It's You. And for me, I have the awesome, amazing privilege that I get to share this last teaching with my amazing wife of close to 20 years. We're going to be, that's right, 20 years in August that we've been married. Today, today is her birthday. Yes. But it's also, it's also the day that I asked her to be my girlfriend. Back March 8th, 1996, it was a Friday night after service. We were in church because that's how we church people do it. Come on, put your hands together. Help me welcome my beautiful wife, Candy. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Candy. Happy birthday to you. All right. You may be seated, baby. You guys may be seated. I thought that it would be I thought that it would be pretty cool if we dedicated an entire week uh, to talk about the 10 things that we wish we would have known before we got married. And if you are how many single people do we have here today? That's right, you're learning. You're learning. Right? It's a, it's a three-step process. First, you scream, then you wave. And third, you look, you look. <laughs> you look for the, the other people who are single. That's right. But, uh, but if you're single and you're here, this for you will be very much preventative. It's a way for you to prevent some of the pitfalls that, that, that we have faced in our marriage. Um, and if you are married... It's also an opportunity for you to take a sharp turn from maybe a frustrating season in your marriage to a place where it's a little bit more fulfilling. So what I want to do is I want to invite the Lord into this. I want to invite the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us as we talk to you uh, from a place of, of, of a real of empathy and compassion. Father, we take this moment to thank you. You're so good. You're so faithful. I pray, God, that we would be uh, hearers today of, of this insight. I, I thank you for the marriages that are represented in this house, those that are here and those that are around the world. Um, I thank you for those that are single that are still believing that uh, marriage does work, that love does exist. Help us, God. Stretch us. Love on us like you only know how to do. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Ten things we wish we would have known before we got married. For those of you that are taking notes, number one, let's start off with this one. We don't stop dating. Don't stop dating each other. Don't stop dating each other. Um, about three years into our marriage, we saw that there's, this was a problem that we were building a family. We were working. There were so many things that we were doing, and we kind of... We missed out on keeping the most important thing uh, centered, and that was paying attention to each other. Do you remember that time? Yes. Um, and, yeah, we just got, I mean, with the newness of marriage, getting to know each other, um, and us working, uh, not to mention uh, Allie was... Was a newborn, so yeah. all of that. Yeah, we, we know how much attention she of, takes. Yeah, we lost sight of. <laughs> we lost sight of ourselves. Yeah, and 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 when when we hear the word dating each other, um, 
uh, what I want to make sure that people understand, we're very practical. So I'm, I'm very pragmatic. Um, I know that there are some books and some preachers and teachers that, that they swear by having a date night every week. We're not good at that. Like we don't have a date night every week where we physically go out. But there are some things that we do. We, we create what I call those moments. Um, just share with, with the people some of the things that we do that might, they might be able to, to do as well. Well, we love coffee, so. Amen to that. I mean. We do love coffee. Yeah, we love to conversate over coffee. Um, watching a Netflix movie, you know, it's free guys, you know. Well, it's not free, we pay for it. But, but I, mean, I, know, I, know, I know it's cheaper than going to the movies. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, we like a lot of free stuff. If we ever even get, <laughs> we do like that. <laughs> We're not supposed to high five. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, but if if we even get to watch a movie, right? So we'll turn it on and we'll pick, try to try to find a movie and... that we can both agree on. Yeah, that never that, happens. I just, yeah. So there's a lot of compromise. I mean, there, there was moments like that you would, you would try to pick a movie, and by the time you pick a movie, I already watched one on my phone. <laughs> I can't be I indecisive. Mean, yeah, you're right. Yeah, no. or, yeah. or there's other times that we just put a movie on, and we finally get to put a movie in. I fall asleep. We start conversating. Yes, we do. So, I mean, that works. Or, nah, it's not. No, just keep it there. Let's keep it. <laughs> There's kids in the room. <laughs> Number two, the 10 things we wish we would have known. So basically, in that one of don't stop dating each other, what we want to make sure is that you realize is that you don't, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it does require for you to be intentional. Um, so I think creativity, making sure that you're on the same wavelength, which we do every single week. We make sure that there's quiet time. That's why I'm a big, big proponent of children not sleeping in your beds. Number two. Get ready to apologize and forgive. Man, get ready to apologize and forgive. Marriage will afford you the opportunity to see the worst side of your spouse. Not just their best side, but their worst side. And boy, do we say some foolish things. All of us, we, you know, we, we, we've, we've all made mistakes. So um, this one, I wish I would have known that, hey, get ready, to get ready to constantly practice asking for forgiveness and apologizing. But this one was hard. Particularly, this one was hard for you. Well, why you got to point that out, babe? No, just... <laughs> okay, let's keep it 100, so... Let's keep it 100, so... So, yeah, I, I really had difficulties. Um, one of the reasons being, obviously, to, you know, acknowledge, you know, as you mature, to acknowledge that you're wrong, you know, it takes... It's hard. Um, but um, I guess my upbringing had, you know... Uh, a lot to do with it too. Um, just the fact that in my household, communication wasn't as prevalent. So, you know, that just stayed with me. And um, so communication is really key in, in, in that component. And so I wasn't very verbal. So for me to verbalize, I'm sorry. Uh, it was very difficult, um, and I expressed, I expressed it in other ways because that was not my love language. So, um, you know, I wasn't a speaker, so um, I expressed it in other ways, but he was not receiving that, uh, I guess, the apology. Um, so the importance of relaying that message verbally was very, very important. And, you know, I, I think that um, this segues into the third thing I wish I would have known before I got married. Number three is that 
childhood baggage does exist and it must be addressed. Right. So when I say childhood baggage, um, our upbringing, we don't just leave it all behind. I mean, we're shaped by the way that we saw conflict, the way that we saw people communicate or not communicate, uh, the argumentative atmosphere versus a peaceful atmosphere. We bring that into our relationships. We bring that into our marriage, and that needs to be addressed. So, for instance, the way that I was raised, I was the youngest child of six. So, if you could imagine, um, if you didn't speak up, you didn't eat. If you didn't fight, if you didn't fight for for your for your for your for to be heard, you weren't going to be heard. So. Uh, we learned, we learned very early on that you have to express yourself. If you don't like something, you say it. So I was, I was very, very much, um, I could easily argue with the best of them and express how I felt and give you a piece of my mind. Um, whereas you were raised a little bit different. Right, so I'm on the total opposite spectrum. So I was just an introvert. Well, yeah, I am an introvert. And, um, but it was good. It was a good balance because you're... It's a good balance now, but it wasn't a good balance then. Right, right. It was frustrating. Right. <laughs> Let me give an example of this and then you could, you could... So very early on in our marriage, we would disagree. And I call it intense fellowship. <laughs> and, um, and of course, if, if she did something or if we were disagreeing... I want to get to the bottom of it. Like, I want to resolve it. So it's, it doesn't matter to me that it's 1130, it's 12 midnight. Like, I want to talk about it. And uh, Candy's like, no, I'm, I'm tired. I want to sleep. So I'm like, no, you're not going to sleep. We're going to talk about this. So I would turn the lights on. I would take the bed sheets. I would take the pillows and hide them. And she's like, I don't need bed sheets. I don't need pillows. All I need is... To be sleepy, I'm sleepy. Bye, Felicia. You know, I'm going to bed. And I wasn't having it. I wasn't having it. So that became very, very contentious. Now, because I was raised completely different. So the compromise, I remember early on in our marriage, it was legit. This was like 2001. We still lived in our first one-bedroom apartment. And I remember that I was so frustrated. And my mom had told me, if you ever get angry in your marriage, go for a drive. Because you can't take back what you say and what you do negatively. So I remember coming back from one of those drives and feeling so like such a failure. Like, I can't get through to her. I am talking, but I'm not connecting. And... I remember that I just, I remember going to the Lord in prayer. God, you need to help me with this because this, this woman's not easy. She doesn't talk. <laughs> and um, and I, remember, I remember that the Lord gave me a strategy. And that strategy was celebrate the good moments you have and let her know how good they feel. So I remember we had a good day. I remember it was a good day and we were both in the kitchen. And... And the kitchen represents where we argue the most and where we have so much more fun and eat, you know? So I remember that we looked at each other and I told her, I looked at her in her eyes and I told her this. I said, doesn't this feel good? We're not arguing. And from there, we started a process of learning how to compromise and understand that you perceive and receive love and you perceive and express communication differently than I do. So the way that I perceive love is by physical touch, because that's the way my mom raised me. My mom and dad were very affectionate. A lot of hugs, a lot of kisses, a lot of words, right? My wife, you know, your love language is acts of kindness, right? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so you express it that way, and you receive it that way. Right, right. The, the key was understanding your love language and being mindful of that. So what I learned is that the more that I, the more acts of kindness that I do for her, the more she'll physically touch me. <laughs> Pretty easy. Husbands, it's not that hard. 
I will clean any dish you want me to clean. I will clean the dish, the pots, the pants, the ventilator, the HVAC ductwork. I will clean the roof, the basement, the foundation. Right. Whatever you want me to clean. Right. But I, I learned, I learned that, but I learned that years later. That's why a book that I recommend everyone should own if you're married is The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. It's a great, great, great book, but also the way you handle conflict versus the way that I handle conflict. Tell them a little bit about your upbringing growing up in your household. Um, so my father was really, um, I would say, easily angered, very high strung. Um, so he was really loud, um, very verbal, but for, if, in the wrong ways. Um, so my mom was an introvert, so she was very quiet. And so I guess the genetics, her genetics were stronger. And we, we, we chose, uh, we want to avoid confrontation with that. <laughs> like, don't mess with that, because he was very high strung. So it was easier for us to just not say anything, just avoid confrontation. And, um, and I think that, that, that also run, ran in the family as well. So that, that really played into um, who I am you know, as a person and how I express myself <laughs> in, in, in any relationship. Yeah, so she brought that to the marriage, so we're not going to say anything. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to work. We're going to have to talk about this. So we learned. We learned uh, after, after a couple of years how to deal with that. And it's, it's brought us to a place of uh, compromise. Um, and now, you know, it, it, it helps me understand. Um, I had to kind of understand your world uh, the, the fact that those things affected the way that you perceived conflict. Conflict is not all negative. Listen up. Conflict is not all negative. Uh, I, I am very fearful when I hear couples say, we never argue. Because I mean, you're not human. <laughs> you know? So um, from there, let's, let's uh, segue to number four. Number four. Marriage is W-O-R-K. Yeah, marriage is spelled W-O-R-K. It's work. Yes. You've heard me say that. So because it's work, I believe that it takes actions 365 days a year, like little by little for you to be intentional so that you can reap uh, the harvest. Um, I believe that if we, if we work it, it works, right? If you work it, it works. And before you know it... Um, it's, uh, it's, it's thriving. Uh, I came across a quote very early on in our marriage, and it said something like this. The key to a successful marriage is falling in love with the same person over and over and over again. And that's work. It is work. It's work to see conflict and to see the worst in people and still choose to say, well, that's my wife, and we got to make this work. Or for her to see the worst of me, and say, well, there's no instant replay here. I'm stuck. I got to make this work. Right. So. I don't know. As you were speaking, like, I just had, like, a flashback of a moment. I, I should share. Go ahead, share. Okay. Share, baby. One of those, you know, learning opportunities, I guess you could call it. Um, so one day we're... we're making breakfast or whatever. And one of the things that, that he uh, adapted <laughs> was um, because of your, your dad not letting you have friends over the house. So when we got married, he wanted to always have people over the house, like constant, like- Every weekend. I'm not gonna- like, Let's do this. Like no notice, no, like, no warning. Spontaneity. Just, <laughs> organic but it was a little excessive so very excessive just the way I love it 
Go ahead. So, so uh, I'm in the kitchen making breakfast, and um, there you go. Thing, the doorbell rings. Like, you gotta be kidding me. It's, a, it's, it's not even at the afternoon yet, right? So, um, you know, okay. Once they leave, I, I just, I just have, have had it. I'm like, that's enough. Like, we, we. You obviously don't understand, or you're not getting. Or anyways, I just, I just went from zero to a hundred real quick, and so I'm making a ham, egg, and cheese sandwich. I remember the day. <laughs> you remember? How can I forget? <laughs> so I, <laughs> I'm cooking as I'm, I'm heated, and all of a sudden, I'm so I, mad. I grabbed a slice of cheese and I threw it at the cupboard. She threw it at the cabinet. At the cabinet. And, and it, it stuck. stuck there. It stuck there. I found it to be hilarious. It stuck there. And you know how much that helps an argument? <laughs> Just laugh. And as I'm, I'm still like heated and I'm talking, and I'm like, you know how women do it. Right? Yeah, I go at 100, especially Latin. Uh, I Latin women. And then all of a sudden, it's trickling down. The cheese is trickling down. Yes. And... I, I'm still cooking, so I grabbed the cheese from the cover and put it in the sandwich and finished my sandwich. Because you don't let a good slice of cheese go to waste. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's what we learned at RWC. But I did not know she was going to share that story, but that is hilarious. Um, but, but it is work. It is work. Understanding, I said this, I said this week one, and, and I want to make sure that you realize this. How you argue in your marriage really, really shows how mature you are. It, it's not the good moments that we learn from. It's those bad moments and how we manage them that give us an idea of how we are. So we shouldn't avoid conflict. I think conflict can really bring out the best of you. I think that a marriage that continues to avoid conflict, what you're really doing is choosing not to grow. Whenever anything is birth, there's always pain. So if you are going to go from where you are to a greater place of maturity, you really have to embrace that it may be on the other side of conflict. And of course, it has to be done with a lot of respect, with a lot of tact, but there is going to be moments of, um, of cheese. Uh, <laughs> a met it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor. All right, so uh, now that leads to number five, to number five. The ultimate goal of marriage isn't only about sex. The ultimate goal of marriage isn't only about sex. You know, I, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to tell you that because we were so young, I was 18, Candy was 20, she's older. I know, I know you can't tell, whatever, whatever. But uh, she's a cougar, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but because we got married so young, um, this was one part that, we thought marriage is the end, when in fact, marriage was just the beginning. We thought, well, you know, this is it. Growing up in the church, like as I preached about last week, you know, before you burn, you might as well get married. Well, you got to be careful with that because sex alone cannot sustain a poor relationship. Because you're going to find it really, really hard to sleep with someone for the rest of your life if you can barely stand them. So during week two of this series, I taught you about the four foundations, the four foundational pillars of a great marriage. I spoke to you about faith. I spoke to you about forgiveness. I spoke to you about friendship. And lastly, I spoke to you about having fun. So that to us was something that I wish somebody would have told us. Because if you don't like him, if you don't like her now, when you get married, it only magnifies at least like 100%. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add to that, babe? No, um, well, the only thing I could add, add is that intimacy doesn't start in the bedroom. 
That's so true. So, like having a relationship, getting... There's so many people that, um, you know, even within the covenant of marriage, um, with the busyness, with whatever's going on, the day-to-day -day tasks, um, we can easily just con come consumed and forget about the other person's needs and basically spending time together and getting to know each other um, and speaking about those real things before going into, in, into the bedroom. And it's, it's crazy, like, they, I guess it's almost like um, a lot of people say sex fixes everything, but that's so not true. It complicates everything. Right. Yeah, like, like we they, spoke about last week with scrambled eggs. <laughs> yeah, and, and... How many people made scrambled eggs this week and you said, I'll never see scrambled eggs ever the same way again? Yeah, like, and I don't know, like, the wife is having a bad day, for instance, and um, the spouse thinks that it's going to be fixed in the bedroom. Like, that, that just doesn't happen. There's a relationship that has to be, you know, there's a That's conversation good. that needs to happen. That's good. That's good stuff. So who you want, who you want your wife or husband to be in the bedroom starts outside of the bedroom. Absolutely. So you have to be intentional with that. Yes. That's why I wash dishes, y'all. <laughs> For real. <laughs> dishes? I'll wash dishes. <laughs> Number six. Ten things we wish we would have known before we got married. Number six. Everyone changes. Every, we change. We, this is not the same woman I met in 1996. It isn't. She, she changes. I've changed. I mean, I think about some of the things that we've changed just on this, you know, let's be superficial first, then we'll go a little bit deeper. But like the way we used to eat, we got married so young, we're like cookies and donut diet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> By the way, there's donuts outside, they're amazing. We're, if you had a donut on the way in, my gosh, they were great. But cookie and donuts, that was my diet. Give us today, Lord, our daily cookie. That's, that's what I was, yeah. So the way we eat is not the same. What we consider to be enjoyable today versus what was enjoyable back then, like a typical weekend when we were younger was what? Like a typical weekend? Um, we were thinking more, I don't know, kid, kid stuff. Like, let's, let's go to a theme park. Let's go to a movie. Let's go to, I don't know, Chuck E. Cheese. It was weird. We were so young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and now, now, what does a typical weekend look like now it's very chill um <laughs> we become old-fashioned folks <laughs> now we like quiet time we like sleep. like on a sunday what do you like doing on a sunday oh, after church yes <laughs> I, a lot of people are gonna agree here with me uh i like taking naps <laughs> it's a lot of nap takers you see that? yeah well, for me, for me uh, on Sunday, for me, a, a typical Sunday would be I leave here after preaching three services, go home, take a quick shower to, to get some strength back, and then I come out and I want to host. Like, I want to cook, I want to have fun, like, I want to, like, party, like, it's like. Exactly like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but. But another thing that has changed is the way that we, for instance, we're never on the same temperature. Nope. So if, I'm, if I'm hot, you're cold. If you're cold, I'm hot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other things that have changed when it, when it comes to us is what we like. There are things I used to love eating that I don't love eating. There are things that I used to love doing before that I don't love doing now. I used to love playing video games. I don't love playing video games now. Um, there were things, like you weren't, into like shooting and guns 20 years ago, but now like you, you want a gun? No, I've always been into that. You've been into that always? Always. Why do you think I joined the military? <laughs> you're right, you're right. But you never told me nothing because you didn't want me to be scared. 
That's what it was. <laughs> but everyone does change. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell them, you too, you too, you change, you change. Number, you want to add something to that? No, I think, I think uh, we also complement each other in that way. So, yeah. um, like, you're good with hosting, you know? Yeah. And I think you're better than you give no, yourself credit for. I, okay, I am, but, <laughs> but, but you know, you're, you're, you're a people person, and I, I've loved people, but not as much as you do, you know? Yeah. So, but that has played into my, my life, and, you know, and your high-strung demeanor, like, I'm like, and you're going at 100, like, I adapted some of that. And then you adapt this on my calmness, you know? Yeah. So it, we kind of complement each other well. Like you've learned, you do. like now, you know, you used to not like sunlight. Yes, that's so and true. Now, and now you, you find yourself opening all the shades in the morning, like, yeah. see, like. Yeah, okay. you've, you've changed me. <laughs> <laughs> and don't let her kid you, she loves you guys. <laughs> She goes, you love people, I don't like people that much, as a thousand people are looking at us. <laughs> Who does that? She does. <laughs> but I get it, I get it, and they get it too. They get the example that, that I love being with people, I really do. Well, she, 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 could be, she could go to the movies by herself. I would never do that. Why? It's, the problem is that <laughs> no, 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 you don't have okay. to explain yourself. I'm okay being by myself. Like, it's yes. okay for me to be by myself. I'm not. And, and I am aware that I need to, to be better. And I'm aware that I'm needy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. No, go ahead. Go ahead, my... <laughs> <laughs> Number seven. Are you guys enjoying this? Number seven, the seventh thing I wish I would have known before I got married. Seek godly counsel, counsel as soon as possible, like ASAP. Like Seek godly says. counsel as quickly as possible. When we were growing up, we did not have premarital counseling. But thanks be to God that here at RWC, there's an entire 12-week course that we dedicate to this in a small group setting. Amen? So that's... Now, when we hear the phrase godly counsel, in a church like this, you're constantly going to hear me talk about the importance of relationships. Jesus sent them out two and two, right, to spread the gospel. Well, we, when we see that, we hear it as one-to-one -one on friends, right? We think about it as far as friendships. But a lot of times, that does not translate to marriage. So we don't think about, man, I got to find me another couple, another couple that could instruct me, another couple that could help me. We were so fortunate early on in our marriage that we surrounded ourselves with a couple that had been married about 10 years, that had kids, that were very successful, that we just kind of, they brought us into their world. They showed us how to argue because they would argue and we would be able to see and model it. Now, I'm not talking about ratchetness. I'm talking about two responsible adults who love God who love themselves, who are committed to the vow of marriage, disagreeing when it comes to something. That helped me. That helped us in the way that they dealt with their kids. So fast forward, now we have other couples like Pastor Joe and Pastor Ada uh, or Pastor Gus and Yvette from Florida. These are people who are much older, who have a greater experience that when, when I have an issue or when I feel like, Something's not right or it's not jiving, I can turn to so that they can give me some perspective. So I, I cannot stress how important this one is. It is. Um, and I think one of the things that you, you have said before is um, why not learn from others' mistakes? So true. And I mean, <laughs> why create the same mistake? if they've done it and they're warning you about it. So um, a, a thing to, to, to consider is when seeking counsel, obviously it has to be someone that knows you as a couple because to give advice, 
You have to, it, the friendship has to be invested. Yeah. You know, they have to know. Like someone that I met, you know, I just met, can't give me advice on, you know, we, we just had an argument and that person's giving me advice and they don't even know Eli. That's not, they're not gonna give good advice. Um, that person has to be bested. That person has to be, you know, has to have wisdom. Um, and, and they basically know who you are. That's good, that's good. So let's segue there to number eight. The eighth thing I wish I would have known before we got married, or we both would have known before we got married, is the little insignificant things become boulders in marriage. In other words, in other words, you can't conquer what you ignore. And before you know it, it's like an avalanche. Most marriages, there's great disdain, there's great disagreements, but what they do is they brush it. They brush it underneath the, 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 the carpet, right? It's a symbolic carpet. Let's just brush it underneath the rug. Let's, let's go on vacation. Let's just spend more money to have this make pretend life um, and then come back to the, to the hell that we live. No. Like, well, you can't mask issues with a vacation or with, or with a social media post. You've got to make sure that these insect, what you consider to be small today, will become greater. The Bible says it this way. Songs of Solomon chapter 2 verse 15 says that it is the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. Not the big ones. Not the big ones. Because the big ones started off very small. So I hope, I hope that one of the things that you take from today is the fact that we all have issues. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell me you have them too. Now, let's not ignore them. If you are married, let's not ignore them. If you are dating someone, don't ignore the warning signs, guys. Confront them head on. If they're hot-tempered, if they're easily angered, if they, are, if they have a wandering eye every time something beautiful walks by, if, they have, if their BFF is an old boyfriend, Hello. <laughs> number nine. Number nine. Know who you are before getting married. This is an obvious one, but it's so important. Like, know who you are before getting married. Because if not, th this is what we did. What you'll do is you'll spend the first several years in your marriage trying to change that person. So I wanted Candy to be more talkative. And she wanted me to be more silent. <laughs> and to wash dishes more and to, right? And, and we had to learn, we had to learn kind of how, okay, so who am I? What are some of the triggers? So this one's really, really important. No one is going to complete you. They're there to compliment you, not complete you. That is a fallacy that does not exist. Only Jesus can bring completion to a man's heart. Is there anything you want to add to that, babe? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, we, in, when we got married, obviously us being so young, um, and Allie, Allie was in the midst of, of it all, so being a new mom, being new parents, um, it was a lot involved. So, me, I had to learn who I was, then also figure out who he was, you know, um, in the midst of it. And it was a little chaotic, it was just a little bit too much. Obviously, it worked out, but it was, it was, it was, <laughs> babe. But it was, uh, it's so, it just works out so much better going into marriage knowing who you are. And, and I think, babe, that when you know who you are, you don't have unrealistic expectations. Right. I think sometimes we're trying, to, we're trying to expect from others an, unre an unrealistic list. So we have a list of this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. And then if you were to compare yourself to your list, I wonder how you fare. So I think that once we know who we are, 
Like, we're able to say, okay, I get it. I mean, I got issues. She got issues. Let's do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, but we go into it thinking that we're perfect when we're not. And lastly, the 10th thing I wish I would have known, we wish we would have known before we got married, number 10. Sometimes space can be a good thing. Sometimes space can be a good thing. So, we don't do everything together. Mm-hmm. We've, we don't. We believe that, that being, having alone time is valuable. So in our relationship, we, um, uh, for instance, like if you're that woman that goes with your husband and his guy friends to watch the baseball game, you creepy. <laughs> if you're that husband that goes out on a girl night with your, with your wife and her girlfriends, You're annoying. You're annoying. <laughs> so, like, what are some of the things that, give them an example. Uh, I'll speak on my behalf, but what are some of the things that you love doing alone? Well, obviously, you know, I love vacationing with girls. Girls trip. Oh, she's done that. I enjoy my alone time. Um, yeah, doing randomness. You know, uh, projects, uh, reading, it doesn't matter what I am doing. Yeah, I, me too. I mean, I, I love uh, getting away with my friends. I love um, watching the game with my friends. Um, a couple years back, I instituted that if the Patriots make it to the Super Bowl, um, it was a guys only party. I know, I know, don't judge me. Um, I, so I had to pay for sushi for my wife, my daughter, spiritual daughters. Um, so that they can go off. <laughs> um, but but uh, we, we enjoy, I go, love going out with my friends. We'll go play basketball, go catch a movie. Uh, we've been doing some movie nights, uh, sporadic movie nights during the week with, some, with my guy, with my friends. Um, and that's all part of making sure that we, that we, keep, it, that we keep it balanced. And let me tell you something, um, I am needy. So I'll tell her, I'll go away for a weekend to minister somewhere, and I'll be back, and, and I'll be like, did you miss me? And she'll tell me this. What do you say, babe, when I tell you that? No. She says, she says. I was having too much fun. She says, you weren't gone long enough for me to miss you. <laughs> what? Of course, because I'm needy, if she goes out shopping, I miss her. Because that's, that's just the way that it is. But I, I do want to tell you how much I love you and appreciate you and admire you on your birthday. Uh, you've been a blessing to me. Your selfless, um, your selfless approach to everything that you do for people. Uh, you're definitely, uh, the, the culture of this church is shaped by your heart, your passion to serve, to get your hands dirty. Um, you can go from looking like a model to, uh, to doing sheetrock work at Christina's house during Hope Week. Um, and you don't, you don't you're, you're the true definition of a leader. You sit last and you eat last and you serve others. I thank you, I honor you, and uh, today we wish you the greatest of all birthdays. Thank you for joining me in closing out this series. I love you. Get over here. Come on, did you enjoy yourself? Let's stand up to our feet. We wanted to make sure that you would have, um, we're a very, uh, I believe in, in pragmatism. I believe that we ought to be a church that, that teaches you the word of God, but then gives you the application. I hope that you find that to be valuable. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things. Have you ever felt like that? Like, I know that it worked for Nebuchadnezzar and Moses, and I know that the Bible says that about Paul, but what does that have to do with me in 2020? So we want to make sure, we want to make sure that the Word of God comes alive and marriage does work. I believe that marriage works. Love is a beautiful thing. Marriage is the perfect picture of the love that Jesus has for his church. So with all of us here today, what I want to do is two things. Right where you are, I would ask that you would just bow your heads and close your eyes. 
I know that there are people here under the sound of my voice who are frustrated. You might be going through one of the hardest seasons in your relationship. And maybe when you hear about marriages that are doing so well, for you it's a little bit frustrating because your marriage is not going well. Or maybe, maybe you're single and you're trying to keep yourself together and you're trying to do what, what you've heard. But it doesn't seem like it's working out and it doesn't seem like Mr. Wright is, is coming or Mrs. Wright. But I believe that Jesus is here to mend the broken hearts. and I believe that it all starts with a relationship with the Lord. So with our eyes closed and, and, our, and our heads bowed, what I would like to do today is give you an opportunity for you to invite Jesus to be the center of your life. For you to invite Jesus to be Lord and bring him to the center of your marriage. And if that is you, if that is you at the count of three, all over this auditorium and for everybody that's listening from around the world, at the count of three, I want you to do the most courageous thing, and that is for you to lift up your right hand. If you say, Pastor, that's me, I need Jesus. One two three lift it up god bless you 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 praise god god bless you god bless you god bless you i see your hand back there praise god salvation is in the room god bless you i see your hand back there god bless you praise god come on church with all of our hands lifted up all of our hands lifted up for for those of you that lifted up your hands first we do it because we want you to know that after today, you will never be by yourself again. That's why we lift up holy hands together with you. And all of us, let us repeat this simple prayer. Come on, let me hear you like never before. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, know I know that I've done some wrongs. Done some wrongs. But, I but I also know that you died on the cross, on the cross. For, all for all of my sins. So today, so today I, accept I accept you as Lord and a savior. savior forgive me forgive and write my name, write my name. In, the in the lamb's book of life today, today we choose life, we choose life. Today, today we choose christ amen. amen and amen hi guys thank you for tuning in if this message has blessed you please don't forget to subscribe you can share the message with your friends and loved ones but also, if you've been touched by the ministry, I want to encourage you to partner up with us. You can follow the link below so that together we can continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Thank you so much.